Hi everyone, thanks for joining us at this morning's webinar, which is on the topic of sleep. Today's webinar is with Dr. Neil Stanley, who is a freelance sleep expert and author of the book, How to Sleep Well. Neil's been involved in sleep as a researcher and as an advisor for 37 years. He was the director of sleep research at the University of Surrey, where he created and managed a sleep lab for clinical trials. He's published uh, 38 peer reviewed papers on various aspects of sleep research, and he advises healthcare professionals, companies, the military, and the general public on various aspects of sleep. So, this webinar came about because Neil and I worked on a couple of projects recently uh, with the military, and they had a um, strong emphasis on, on sleep and fatigue. And Neil also contributed to a chapter in my book uh, on measurement of sleep and um, how we can measure it and if measurement uh, is actually useful, which is a topic which might come up in this webinar. Uh, so, Neil, um, I'll just um, get straight into the questions, if that's OK. I'll start with one from some of these have left their names and others uh, haven't uh, have left handles. So this one's from Mike, and there's probably quite a common question that you get, uh, Neil. Um, what would you recommend doing if you wake up at 2 a.m. and can't get back to sleep? I've heard of many different approaches, such as reading, listening to music, meditation, etc. Yeah, I mean, that, that's a good question. It's a, a phenomenon that we've all suffered from. And in a way, the answer is exactly what you would do at the start of the night. Um, in order to get sleep, uh, you need just three things. There are thousands of sleep tips out there, but they fall under three categories. One is a bedroom conducive to sleep, so dark, quiet, cool, comfortable. Another is a relaxed body, um, but the main one, the absolute prerequisite for a good night's sleep or to get to sleep is a quiet mind. So those things that you read out um, about reading a book or listening to music or whatever are about quietening the mind. But we all are different. Uh, personally, I read every night before I go to bed. Um, but that's not to say that that's what everybody should do. It's whatever quietens the mind. Um, the problem in the middle of the night, of course, is there's no competition. Uh, your thoughts are racing and you've got nothing to distract you. Your eyes are closed, it's dark, uh, it's quiet. Uh, so there's nothing to distract you. So your mind races. And so what you need to do is to try and quieten the mind. Um, now, if you're lying in bed, you can do things like thought blocking. So subtracting seven from a thousand repeatedly or going through the alphabet, naming an animal beginning with each letter of the alphabet, uh, something like that, something that distracts you from the cares and concerns of what you're actually worried about. But the top advice is if after about 20 minutes, and when I say about 20 minutes, I don't mean check your watch, but if after 20 minutes you still haven't fallen asleep, then get up, go somewhere, go to a different room, do something relaxing, and then go back to bed when you feel sleepy again. Because there's no point lying in bed, getting ever more frustrated, tossing and turning, hating your duvet, your mattress, your pillow, your bed partner, doing that panic math. So if I don't fall asleep within the next 10 minutes, I'll never get to sleep. Oh my God, I still haven't fallen asleep. Oh, I'll never sleep. Oh, terrible. You know, if you start doing that, that's just going to keep you awake. So get up, go somewhere else, do something relaxing, whatever that may be, knit, listen to the shipping forecast, have a cup of tea, it doesn't matter what you do. Uh, but when you feel sleepy again, go back to sleep, start the process again, and hopefully uh, that will help you uh, go back to sleep. Thanks. I think there's some really interesting and really practical tips in there. And uh, this is a question that I asked you um, last time we met up is that the there's a couple of schools of thought on what to do if you kind of can't get to sleep. And um, some advice that I'd been given um, was to not get out of bed. And could you describe exactly why that staying in bed could be problematic? 
because it's all about the mind. It's all about being able to control what you're thinking about. It doesn't matter where you are. It matters what you're thinking. And if you're lying in bed and say doing that panic mass or or catastrophizing, or if I don't get a good night's sleep tonight, then then I'll make mistakes at work and the boss will sack me. If you're doing that, then that's not going to help you fall back to sleep. If you're lying there all snugly and warm and comfortable and thinking lovely, lovely thoughts, absolutely, don't don't break that at all. And this is why I say about 20 minutes in, you know, before you start going, oh, sod it, I haven't fallen asleep yet. Before you do that, break that cycle. Lying in bed, as I say, if you are catastrophizing, is the worst possible thing to do. So the advice of getting out of the bed just is that break. And for many of us, um, literally just getting up and going for a pee, doesn't the bed seem more comfortable? Just when you get back in, you just you flip the pillow over and think, oh, this is nice. So even that is enough sometimes. But I say lying in bed, it depends on your state of mind. That's the key thing about sleep. I suppose that other opposite advice comes from the, the sort of old housewife's tale of, well, at least you're resting when you're in bed. And but as you say, then you, if you create those sort of negative uh, associations with just lying in bed awake, that probably feeds into the, the problem potentially. Absolutely. This is something called um, this is you know, this idea of stimulus control. It's called it was developed in 1972, this idea that you go into your bed to sleep that's the only activity you do in your bed is sleep and there is no wake uh, activities done or nothing that is designed to wake you and this idea that rest rest is for the body it's not for the mind sleep is for the brain rest is for the body so rest is not the same as sleep there is no benefit you can rest as much as you like you're not going to get the benefit that you would accrue from sleep. So they're two different things. And you know, you can be absolutely physically exhausted and you get into bed and you can't fall asleep because your mind is racing. So this is what people have forgotten, that the only bit of the body that must have sleep is the brain. That's, so that's a really good point. I, I learned that lesson myself after uh, quite a while ago. I was uh, doing a lot of cycling and I would do I did a 120 mile uh, bike ride one day. We went down to Brighton and back. So I was physically exhausted, but yet I still couldn't sleep. And uh, so that kind of rings true with me. Whilst your body can be very tired, the only real way to, to get um, that true sort of rest and restoration is, is actually uh, sleep. So you can't just kind of lie there and recover. Yeah, I mean, as I say, it, it, it's about this is this is what people forget. People think that there is a surrogate for sleep, that, that, that you can do something. Um, you know, there, there's various accounts of you know, Buddhist monks who only need to sleep very, very little because they spend their time in meditation. That's not true. Meditation is just quiet relaxation. It is not sleep. There is a specific brain waveform that you only get if you are sleeping. And that cannot be faked in any other way. And I think this brings us on nicely to, uh, I'm going to cut through to a, uh, another question, which is um, sort of interrelated to this. Uh, and this comes from Cam. And it, he said, I've read that you need to sleep eight hours a night. He said, no matter what time I go to bed, I always seem to wake up after six or seven hours and I can't get back to sleep. I don't feel particularly tired when I wake up. Is this just a habit that I have or do you think my body doesn't need eight hours of sleep? Absolutely. Uh, Eight hours is a complete and utter myth. Uh, No eminent man or woman of science or medicine in the last 600 years has ever recommended we all get eight hours sleep. Um, Vaughan in 1764 said man should sleep according to his complexion. Um, So some people uh, need a lot of sleep. Some people need 
a little amount of sleep to be refreshed. Um, and essentially, your sleep need is as individual as your height or your shoe size. Um, so saying everybody should get eight hours sleep is like saying everybody should wear size nine shoes. Well, it might fit for many people, but for other people, it's completely pointless. So you need to get the sleep you need. So some people, very, very small percentage, some people can thrive absolutely on four hours sleep. Other people need 11 hours sleep to thrive. After 40 years as a sleep expert, I know I need nine and a half hours sleep to feel wow. my best. And if I got eight hours sleep, I would be rubbish. One hour less sleep than you need is a sleep problem. So the key thing to work out how much sleep you need, it is incredibly easy. You ask yourself at about 11 o'clock in the morning, how do I feel? Do I feel awake, alert, and focused? If you do, then you had enough sleep. Presumably, you, though, that, that, that changes depending on the time you wake up, though. Like, if you're, I'm yeah, thinking I mean, if you're a student and you wake up at just, 10 well, I mean, This is why it's 11 o'clock. You should never ask yourself when you just wake up. But 11 o'clock, most people are on their rising phase of their circadian awareness. But anyway, so if you're, if you're awake and alert and focused, you've had enough sleep. If you're tired, well, tired means nothing when you talk about sleep. Tired is having a bit of a rubbish life. Tired is, you know, it's it's hot and it's August and it's Friday and I didn't win the Euro millions and I've tripped over the cat this morning. It's got nothing to do with sleep. If you are sleepy at midday, then you have a problem with your sleep. And you might say, what's the difference between being tired and being sleepy? It's very simple. You walk up three flights of stairs. When you get to the top, do you need a sit down or do you need a sleep? If you need a sit down, you're tired, fatigued, knackered, exhausted. If you could lie down and go to sleep, then you are sleepy. So it doesn't matter how many hours you sleep, as long as you feel good during the day. If you feel good during the day, don't worry. If you feel sleepy during the day, then there is an issue. And it's as simple as that. And, that, and this, I think that's a really important distinction that, that um, we talked about a lot when we were doing our last uh, study, is that we were essentially were, with our participants, they were sleep deprived to a, a degree. And we had to um, measure um, their alertness and do various tests. And one of the things that we had to distinguish with them is because they were doing a highly physical task as well, is to distinguish between sleepiness and actual physical fatigue, uh, because sometimes the two get sort of lumped in together. But as you just mentioned there, Neil, they're actually very different. Um, so sleepiness, if you, if you just, just to confirm, that's the state of actually wanting to fall asleep as opposed to um, I'm feeling sort of fatigued. Absolutely. And this is the key thing, because we often... Uh, it's the lack of the language people use interchange. I mean, normally they say tired or sleepy. Some people will talk about fatigue. Uh, again, fatigue is not being sleepy. Fatigue is muscle weakness, um, slow uh, lack of enthusiasm. That's what fatigue is. Sleep is unique in it is the desire to fall asleep. So if you can't <laughs> sitting there nodding with your eyes closed then you're not sleepy you may be something else and being sleepy may contribute to your feeling of fatigue but they're not the same and so using being specific and this is one one of the things that i have to teach um uh, healthcare professionals doctors and that is to listen to what the patient is saying because a patient will ramp up saying doctor doctor i'm tired well, what does that mean? Does it mean you're depressed? Does it mean you're sleepy? Or does it mean you've just had a bad day? Because they're, they're very different phenomena. So this is, you have to use the correct word and understand it. So just saying, I'm fatigued, I'll take a power nap. Well, no, because you're not sleepy. So you'll lie there for 30 minutes and achieve nothing because you're not sleepy. And it is... Finding out sleepiness, how sleepy you are, is that quite difficult in today's modern environment? Because a lot of things might mask our sleepiness and it's only really in those periods 
where you may be, I don't know, sat on a train commuting or listening to a, <laughs> a boring talk or something where you start to drift off. So does it become quite difficult to find out exactly if you are sleepy? Yeah, I mean, that that's the problem. You, you know, sometimes, um, you know, this, being sleepy is like being hungry. Uh, and you know, that if you're really into something, really working hard, you sometimes forget to have lunch. And you think, well, I, you know, I, I usually eat, you know, loads of food at lunchtime, but today I didn't because I was concentrating and I forgot that. And we live in a in a world where we are hyper stimulated all the time. Uh, we don't take breaks. We, you know, nobody has a lunch an hour long lunch break. What a mad idea that is these days. Um, so we, we we don't listen to our body. Um, and uh, this is this is the big thing, and and certainly, um, you know, you mentioned at the start that I wrote the chapter for the book about monitoring. If you could just go back for us uh, a minute or so, because we yeah. we we lost you. Okay, so it's about listening to your body, and in our busy day to day lives, we don't actually do that. And indeed, we've gone the exact opposite of that because we're now using devices to tell us how we feel. So we will measure our sleep and that will tell us that we've had enough sleep and therefore we're good to go. We're ready to go. And so this is this is masking us actually listening to our body. And there, there is going to come a point where there will be a very interesting legal case where somebody will have a crash in a car and the, the police will say that was dangerous driving because you're fatigued or you're sleepy. And the person will say, no, but my Fitbit told me I had had a perfectly good night's sleep. I will be fine. And, and that's where people, um, they're relying on devices to tell them how to feel rather than actually just asking themselves a simple question, could I fall asleep now? And I say, after 40 years of measuring people's sleep, I frankly don't care uh, all about the squiggly lines or how long you slept or how much you woke up in the night. If you feel fine during the day, don't worry about it. Don't you don't need this, that, or the other. And you'll only, I mean, there's this thing now called orthosomnia, the search for perfect sleep, you know, competing against your Fitbit um, to, to, to get a better sleep. Oh, I scored 73 on my my sleep tracker. Uh, that's terrible. I should be 80 tomorrow. 80 what? They don't tell you what this 80 is. So is 80 better than 72 or 65? You have no idea. It's a meaningless figure. Um, and yet people are becoming obsessed about their sleep, which is actually causing insomnia. People are That, that was going to be my one of my questions, is that um, becoming quite neurotic about it, it, it almost seems like, well, with the creation of that term, I guess it, it, it uh, is becoming a problem in that people are trying to fix problems they don't actually have because we're being exposed to so much information. And uh, this actually came up, I was recently discussing this with someone on um, social media about a particular book, which really um, was very popular a few years ago um, when it was published. And it really uh, catastrophized issues if you don't get uh, enough sleep. And um, there's been certain people uh, that have sort of wrote, uh, rebuttals to the book and question the accuracy in some parts but also said this is going to cause a lot of problems yeah because people reading it are going to then going to think oh well my problem is now even worse than i thought it was yeah I, I, and you know that that book um is interesting uh because people are patients are now citing it as a cause of their insomnia um, yeah. But what's interesting is back in 1916, so 106 years ago, uh, an American doctor called James Walsh published a, a paper called Insomnia is Dread. And he said all those years ago, that I paraphrase, uh, the biggest cause of insomnia uh, now is being told you'll die or go mad if you don't sleep. 
um, scaring the bejesus out of people uh, in order to get them to sleep is not the way to do it. It, it is completely the opposite way because it, you cause that very anxiety. And this is what we face. We, we live in a halcyon time for sleep. We have lovely beds, we have warmth, we have safety, we have a great time to sleep. And yet, for some reason, we are not sleeping. We are literally worrying ourselves uh, out of sleep. Uh, and that really is the, the problem um, that, that, that we face. That, that that book you mentioned was by far the biggest selling sleep book. And I, I think I will just mention it because I know I'm going to get asked this. It, it was it was How to Sleep Well or, or Why How We to Sleep. Sleep by Matt Why Walker. We Sleep. Well, sorry, it wasn't your book. <laughs> no, my, my book is the complete your antidote book. to his book. Yes, um, it was uh, why we sleep, and um, yeah, it was it was uh, a bestseller, wasn't it? And but yeah, I mean, so it's it quite had, controversial because it, it had a huge amount of money spent behind it. There was massive amounts of promotion for it, um, and you know, it's been justifiably criticised because, and I've done it myself. Uh, there, there was ridiculous manipulation of data, cutting off graphs from papers to prove your point and things like that. For somebody who is a professor, it was quite shocking how, how uh, laissez-faire he was um, about uh, presenting the data. But it was had a massive, massive amount of publicity behind it. And, and you know... I, I, I think it's the only book that I've ever had people come up to me and say, oh, I've read that book. They haven't read my blooming book, but they've read that book. Um, and they say it's the only book that, that, that I know that people have regularly mentioned. And it has been incredibly influential, but very, very damaging. And I think the problem with it is that, and this is the discussion I was having the other day, is that um, the person said, well, um, the author... Matt Walker has, has uh, been on podcasts and things and sort of clarified certain points. But my problem with that is how many of the readers have listened, you know, there's thousands of podcasts and how many of the readers have actually listened to these clarifications? I don't think so. So I, it, it, the problem is it's gone. It was so such a mainstream book that that and it's actually been I think it's been cited now um, in in other publications. So it's kind of it's it's gone down as as fact when some elements of it maybe aren't as accurate as or, or they lack accuracy yeah and, and this is the problem this is the 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 uh, issue when i when i started in in sleep research 40 years ago there was one book uh for the general public um and um secrets of sleep by A alex borbay um, and I, I read that on day one of my career back in February 82. Um, behind me, uh, there are the 421 sleep books I bought during lockdown, uh, which would add to my uh, library of over two and a half thousand sleep books. But that's um, got to be a, a record there. Again, it's it's got to be a sad the biggest record. sleep library. Uh, it probably is. Um, and the issue is there's now loads of people giving advice about sleep, many of them having no qualification in sleep at all. Um, that's that's and, exactly why I, I got you on, Neil, and, and have commissioned other experts to come on. is Because it's something that I'm being asked more about because of the, the line of my research and my PhD, but I'm not an expert in it and certainly not in, a, in any sense understand like the clinical side of, of sleep and sleep issues. So that I think that's a really important point that it's on the surface, it's quite easy to set yourself up as a, as an expert in sleep because Absolutely. of what it is. Well, I mean, the, the, the most influential, well, one of the most influential books used by sportsmen uh, in, 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 in about sleep, was written by somebody whose only qualification to talk about sleep was that he was European sales director for a mattress company. That's it. He has no training, he has no knowledge, he has no expertise in sleep, but he wrote a book, he worked with Man United, he supposedly told Cristiano Ronaldo how to sleep and he influenced Sky, uh, Team Sky's cycling. 
and he knows nothing about sleep. The, the, what he does talk about is nonsense. This sleeping in 90 minute sleep cycle. The first paper describing sleep cycles back in 1967 said that the average sleep cycle is 95 minutes, not 90 minutes. And they range from between 38 minutes and 152 minutes. So anybody who says you need five sleep cycles a night is talking nonsense. Anybody who is measuring 90 minute sleep cycles could be two and a half hours out by the end of the night. And, and of course, people... you can't measure it at home anyway. Exactly. <laughs> So this is, com but so I say to reduce it to its 90 minutes, therefore get five 90 minute cycles. Well, that's seven and a half hours, which is exactly what everybody else talks about how much roughly we need seven to nine hours. And it's dressed up as some sort of nonsense. And just because he wrote to, to Alex Ferguson said, oh, I'm a sleep expert. And Alex Ferguson, knowing sod all about sleep, actually employed him. He now sets himself up as a sleep expert. And people read this absolute nonsense um, and, and believe it. And, and it's, it's un to me, it's uh, unbelievable. What people yeah, with it, without terrible. going off on too much of a time, it's, it's, no, no it's, it's my fault with my line of questioning with the other uh, book is... Um, it's something I um, uh, wrote a short blog on the other day is about this distinction between, and it's sort of the basis for, for the, the book that I wrote um, that you contributed to is uh, between uh, experience and expertise, how you could do something and give people advice and accrue experience doing that and get good results. But expertise is it, it, deeper than that. So it's mm -hmm. actually having formal education, some training alongside your experience as, as well. It's not just about doing something repeatedly and, and, and seeing how it goes. But yeah, um, and, and this is it. Um, you know, anybody, you can actually set yourself up as a sleep expert by doing a three day course, a sleep practitioner's course, three days. That's all it takes to learn everything about sleep according to them i'm i'm 40 years in and i'm still you know i've printed or just you know printing off papers as we speak uh, to learn because a new paper came out today and, and and this is the problem take wisdom from the wise not not just somebody with an mba who wants to charge you i mean this person who talks to sleep uh, to athletes he charges for a lecture about 20 times more than I charge. Well, good, so I'm cheap. Good. It's if a good gig wants, if you can get it. If anybody wants me to talk, I'm very, very cheap. And I actually know what I'm talking about. Anyway, that's, that's the advert over. <laughs> no worries. Um, I'm going to come on to a, 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 the next question, which is sort of related to the one of the previous ones in the requirement for, for sleep. Uh, this comes from Mark, and he's asked, uh, can you train your body to function with less sleep? No, you okay you can train yourself to cope with less sleep um my suggestion is why would you want to you wouldn't ask a personal trainer can i train myself to be less fit you wouldn't ask a, 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 a dietitian can you train yourself to survive on big mac so I don't know why you would want to scrimp on the thing that is the most important thing you can do in life, which is get a good night's sleep. Um, but you're only training yourself to cope because your sleep need is genetically determined. So in the same way that I'm one meter 97, I love being tall, except for when I fly Ryanair, when I wish <laughs> I could be shorter. And when I stand at the check-in desk going, I wish I was five foot four, I wish I was five foot four, not going to happen. So you can train yourself to cope, but then you go through life not feeling at your best. You know, I uh, think it's the same as um, it, it, to draw on something similar that um, many people are interested in nutrition is that, it's like saying, can I get by on less calories? So doing uh, an intensive diet and I'd say you can, uh, it, it's not by no means going to help you function better and it's going to be difficult and unpleasant, 
but it's a similar thing right with with sleep you can tolerate it but it's not really a good idea to do that yeah and going back to what i was saying about how you feel during the day i mean i often when i talk uh, do lectures i say on a scale of one uh, zero to ten how sleepy are you now zero if i had to shut up for a second you'd instantly fall asleep and 10 you're the most awake you've ever been i never get 10 barely ever get nines i get maybe a smattering of eights but most people are sixes and sevens and i say well why are you going through your life as a six or a seven is that is that all you've all you've set yourself up to be is a six is that as good as it gets for you and and we're selling ourselves short saying i need what are you going to do with the time you've got from sleeping less i suppose it comes from a certain uh, personality type of you know sleep when you're dead type um well mantra. yes absolutely <laughs> um and it probably downplay well it does downplay if you're asking that question you're kind of saying that sleep's maybe not in important as other aspects of your life for example you know if people are trying to uh, run their business and they maybe don't have uh, enough hours in the day then they start thinking oh can I dip into sleep so I suppose that's where the question sort of comes from is that people want to do more in the day and they see sleep as almost as, as an inconvenience I suppose but again 16 hours at 60 percent is n not as good as 10 hours at 100 sure, uh, and, and this is this is the, what i'm saying that you need to have sleep in order to do the other things you know sleep is about problem solving decision making um recovery from exercise immune system function if you have a bad night's sleep one night's bad night's sleep the next day you're four times more likely to catch the common cold and I'll, so I'll, if you exercise when you're sleepy, you're at a 75 cent increased risk of a sports related injury. You, you know, one thing you... that um, I, I'm just thinking of another question that's on here that kind of uh, relates to sleepiness and something that many people do to try and um, uh, alleviate sleepiness is, is drink uh, coffee or, or something with caffeine in. Um, and this question is from Kate. And she said that um, I've heard that drinking coffee in the afternoon can disrupt your sleep. What time should you stop drinking coffee to avoid this? So this is a common thing, isn't it? That people yep. feel sleepy and they reach for a, a cup of coffee or an espresso or something. OK, well, we're all very, very different in our susceptibility to caffeine. Um, and there's no fixed time. You all know people who can have two double espressos at the end of a meal and sleep perfectly well. So it's about your sensitivity. Yes, caffeine can stay around in the body for a long time, uh, up to 10 hours. And so, yes, a, a coffee in the mid-afternoon could still be disturbing your sleep because the amount of caffeine needed to give you a boost is a lot more than the amount of caffeine needed to disturb your sleep. Um, but coffee is a very bad drug delivery system. Uh, you have no idea how much caffeine is in any cup of coffee. Um, so you could have two strong black cups of coffee and actually get zero caffeine, even though it's not decaf. You could get as much as 800 milligrams of caffeine. Um, caffeine describes an inverted U. Um, and so anything more than 600 milligrams actually will start putting you to sleep. So you have no you can't taste caffeine. If you are going to want to use caffeine, and I'd suggest you don't have a power nap instead. But if you are going to use caffeine, use a functional energy drink. Um, use uh, you know one of these cans of drinks because at least you know that they have actually got a declared amount of caffeine in them but far better to have a nap because the benefits of caffeine take 30 minutes to kick in and then they only last for about 30 minutes whereas a 20 minute power nap will last you uh, will boost your performance by uh, quite a significant amount for three to four hours and, and what you mentioned there, it's an interesting point about uh, individual differences, because there's been quite a lot of research which has looked into this, particularly in sports nutrition, is the effect of, sort of your uh, genotype on uh, how you metabolize caffeine. And, and because 
studies often had high responders and people that had different symptoms because they usually use quite a high dosage sort of up to six milligrams per kilo of body mass in some studies and um, that kind of genetic differences can account for caffeine metabolism which is why some people get jittery after uh, a coffee yeah. um, whereas others can drink it like water all day and as you say fall back to sleep so there's there's I believe there are kind of tests that you can do that are getting better to determine um, how you might uh, respond to caffeine. But as you said, probably the best way is, is uh, not to become reliant on it and yeah. self-experimentation. And, and one one very surprising thing that I learned recently is that the contraceptive pill actually doubles the uh, time to process uh, caffeine. So, you know, so it's not just in genetics, but yeah, it's far more... If you feel sleepy, your body wants sleep. It doesn't want to be woken up. Yeah, it, it's um, a problem in some uh, gym goers that go, that train in the evening. Well, I think that's become quite popular is um, pre-workout drinks, which have got basically, usually always got um, a number of stimulants, but the main one's caffeine. And people taking those to um, sort of perk them up before they go and lift weights or do a workout in the evening. And then it has a knock on effect um, uh, on, on sleep. And I think this is a problem with athletes as well that use caffeine for evening fixtures is that they get the stimulation from competing, but also the, the caffeine half-life as well is, is pretty long. And that, okay, evening events are, are you know a different thing, but if you are voluntarily needing to take stimulants in order to be able to work out in the evening, surely that is telling you that there's something wrong there um you, you, you shouldn't need to do that you should exercise when you feel able to exercise and I say if you exercise when you are sleepy you will have a significant increase in your sports related injury that's going to finish your career um you, you know potentially why would you put yourself in that risk that's why i don't recommend pre-workouts or caffeine uh, before uh, late afternoon or evening um, training sessions because it can actually you, the pick me up that you get from it is negated by the fact that you probably recovery time window after training is is impacted because you disturb your sleep so much yep. with the, with those stimulants so um, um yeah it's just a general rule uh, not rule but um piece of advice I'd avoid uh, pre-workout supplements uh, for afternoon or evening workouts um Sticking with the athlete theme, this um, this one's come in from Kirsty, uh, and she said, "I uh, have often heard of athletes that race away. Um, I'm assume she means endurance athletes like to take their own bedding with them, so it's easier to fall asleep. What advice for athletes does Neil have for someone heading to an international event when you can't, due to uh, lug luggage restrictions, take your own bedding?" Well, I mean, the key thing about uh, sleep is that you can only sleep if you feel safe and secure. So taking your own bedding is only part of that. If you think about your bedroom, there are, there are many things going on in your bedroom, not least your bed. Uh, it doesn't matter if you've got your own bedding, unless you're taking your own mattress with you, that's, that's not really uh, very useful. And the problem is, um, you know, I certainly uh, had to warn uh, the British Paralympic team during the uh, London Olympics that the beds in the Olympic Village were absolutely rubbish. Uh, they were very cheap, they were very nasty, and the only design criteria for them was that they were recyclable. And so actually the British Paralympic team actually took their own beds with them because it was London. Um, so there are many things. So it's about the noises. It's about the smells. It's about the position of the bed, the position of the door. You cannot um, you cannot do all of that. You can't replicate your home in a hotel or whatever. So what you've got to do is the best to, to reduce that anxiety. You're always going to have a bad night's sleep for a few nights in any environment that you're going to go in it's called the first night effect because your brain hasn't yet processed the noises the smells etc etc but take something from home um that helps you if you've got a teddy bear take a teddy bear um teddy bears are good um so anything like that um but as i say the, the best thing to do is to um 
you know, give yourself some time to adapt to where you are. Um, so, um, you know, this is great in the past because, you know, everybody went by ship. And so by the time they got somewhere, they were fully, um, fully uh, acclimatized. But now, of course, with jet travel, people fly in, do something, then fly back. And that's not really ideal unless you literally fly in and fly out and you literally don't sort of sleep where you are. Um, it, it, it is a problem, and, and we know uh, from work done um, with with uh, basketball teams and the NFL that moving across America uh, does actually uh, having home advantage does matter when it comes to athletic performance. Uh, it's, it's almost like you've read the second part of Kirsty's uh, question. You know, <laughs> she, she's actually said, um, uh, how do you sleep well when the time differences are involved? For example, being seven hours behind home time and the new race time zone. Yeah, well, this is, this is the problem. Say, this is about that adaptation. Um, with regards to how to do that is if it's light, stay awake. If it's dark, go to sleep. Uh, that's a hard and fast rule. Whatever time it is, people. Some people say, "Oh, keep your watch on home time." Well, your watch doesn't control your circadian rhythm. The sun controls the circadian rhythm. So, what it says on your watch doesn't matter. It's when the sun comes up, when the sun goes down. So, keeping uh, to the local time. So, if it goes dark, whatever time you think it is, go to sleep or try to go to sleep and wake up when it's like eat. Uh, at the culturally correct time where you are because food we have a food related clock which also sets our circadian rhythm um acclimatize would be the best thing but it takes about a day and a half for every hour you change so if you were to go to new york it would take you up to 10 days to acclimatize um so that is a real problem but there is a real issue as to timing of um of athletic events i mean we saw this at the weekend with the joshua fight you know middle of the night in yeah in he was over, i think he did uh five weeks over there yeah uh beforehand but, to to try and yeah you know, overcome that unless you've stumbled out of the pub Having a fight at one o'clock in the morning really isn't the right time for doing that. And he, of course, acclimatized to that time. So it really was one, two o'clock in the morning that he was fighting. So we, we do have this problem that timing of athletic events is much more to do with TV audiences rather than it being the best time for the athlete. But acclimatization, but of course, nobody, none of the sports bodies can afford that. Uh, to stay there for five weeks. Uh, and the other bizarre thing, which I find absolutely bizarre, is teams who make you share hotel rooms. You know, because somehow this will help you bond. Well, when I go away on stag do's, I pay extra. So I say, don't share a bedroom <laughs> because I want to get my sleep. Why would you, if you're the English FA, why are you putting football players? into rooms where they have to share that's a nonsense if you wanted to prioritize your sleep and, and coming back onto the the, the environment and uh, Kirsty's first question there do you think almost having props so to speak could be feed into that problem of of uh, orth, orth, somnia, potentially because you kind of like oh I haven't got my um, oh, I, I, um, my duvet or I haven't yeah, got my yeah, sleep yeah. mask with me exactly and then... the, the, ang the anxiety of I won't get to sleep because I don't have my teddy bear well guess what you're not going to get a good night's sleep the minute you think I'm going to have a bad night's sleep you will have a bad night's sleep because you're going to worry about that so so yeah relying too much on pop because I say this is the issue you cannot always take what you need or you cannot take all that you need so the best thing to do as i say is um you know have a, a, a you know have a good wind down routine relax um take ear plugs take ear eye uh, eye shades um you know to cut down the noise and light which is two things you can easily do um and, and then just just get on with it and th this is probably something we've spoken about previously neil is that um people looking for methods to kind of 
hack, so to speak, um, sleep, when it's actually something that's pretty passive in the more you try and fix it, and I'm doing inverted commas, um, the worse you can potentially make it. Yeah, ab- absolutely. And and this is it. We, we need to think about sleep. Sleep is important and it's vitally important. But as a particular athletic company would say, just do it. Um, you know, if you have the right mindset, uh, you know, a quiet mind, a relaxed body and a comfortable bedroom, you should be able to sleep. I mean, you know, we, 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 we have no problems. We, we, you know, we, we talk about athletes taking their own bedding. They don't take their own bedding when they go on holiday. Uh, and they sleep perfectly well in a situation that they would never sleep in ordinarily. Why? Because they're relaxed, they're stress-free, they're not competing, et cetera, et cetera. So it's much more to do with the mind rather than, than anything else about getting good night's sleep. So going to bed each night with the perception that you are going to get a good night's sleep and not to worry if you don't. The Americans have a wonderful phrase, if not tonight, then tomorrow night. If you don't get a good night's sleep tonight, you'll almost certainly, all things being equal, get a good night's sleep tomorrow night. So don't worry about it. And could, could you explain just for the audience why that is like the, the concept of building up sleep pressure? So if you, if you have a bad night, you're probably going to have a better night the next night. Yeah, I mean, because we, we have, during the night we have four stages of sleep um some three in non-rem and and rem which is the dreaming sleep now the most rem for the audience is rapid rapid eye movement movement sleep now the stage three sleep the deep sleep the delta sleep the slow wave sleep is the most important part of sleep this is when you lay down memories this is when you learn this is the only time you physically grow this is when you optimize your immune system this is when you uh, rebuild your muscles all the important things really happen in that n3 sleep and that makes up about 25 percent of the night and the body and the brain will make sure you get that deep sleep come hell or high water you will get that deep sleep but if you have a bad night's sleep and you don't get the deep sleep you need, you will make it up the next night. You'll make up 100% of your missing delta sleep. So you know sometimes you have a sleep where you go to bed and you literally die for eight hours and you wake up and you remember nothing and you're in exactly the same position. That's because you've had that delta sleep. Uh, You've made up that deep sleep. So the body needs that deep sleep and it will get it. So if you have a disturbed night, you will almost certainly have a much better night the next night, as long as there isn't something directly influencing your sleep. And I, I can vouch for that after having um, uh, a, a newborn uh, three years ago, where some nights you, you could be in bed for like eight hours, but it just waking up all of the time. So you're never really getting into that deep sleep. And then the next day, I might only get four hours sleep, but it's as you just described there, you're kind of dead to the world and you wake up actually feeling refreshed because your body's sort of gone almost straight into that uh, or, or skipped into the, the the deeper phase of sleep. And and this is why you can't catch up on sleep. <clears throat> you can't you know, have poor sleep in the week and then catch up at the weekend because there is only a finite amount <laughs> You can't have more than 100% if you see what I mean. So one or two poor night's sleep, yes, you can make up. But once you go past that, you're now running a sleep debt, which you cannot pay back. You can pay a bit of it back, but you can't pay all of it back. That's a really nice segue into one of the live questions that's uh, just come in um, from Katrina. He's uh, asked about, um, ultra endurance um, athletes she says they have to run or bike through the night in events what's the best strategy before an event can you learn to tolerate or can you bank sleep and what strategies would you consider during an event and just for the audience uh, sleep banking is something that's been um, uh, researched fairly recently in, in, in the sports science literature and that this is the concept of If you're going into a a period or an event where you know you're not going to sleep, then you try and get more sleep 
beforehand so that so you're kind of putting it in the bank so to speak so be interesting to get your thoughts on this neil uh this idea of banking sleep before uh, uh an event no sleep sleep's not like money you can't bank it. Uh, it, it it just doesn't happen because you know what it's like on a sunday night uh you've had a lazy sunday you go to bed a bit early because it's going to be monday and you lie in bed there until your usual bedtime anyway uh, you, you can't force yourself to sleep. You can't. So if you are regular with your sleep habits, then going to bed a bit earlier or going to bed two hours earlier, you just means you're going to lie there for two hours getting frustrated. Um, with regards to uh, endurance athletes, of course, uh, there are some people who advocate polyphasic napping. And this is Claudio Stampi's idea that you nap for 20 minutes every two hours. Um, if you are going to do a shortish event, then that's probably the best way to do it. But it is not a way of life. If you read Ellen MacArthur's account of her solo uh, circumnavigation, she said it was bloody awful, but it's the only thing you can do on a boat. So, you know, <laughs> you've got to do it sort of thing. Um, but it, it, is, it is difficult because, again, some people can nap, some people can't nap. Um, or, or find it easy. I can't nap. I can't. I couldn't just switch off for two hours, uh, for twenty minutes every two hours. Um, so if I fell asleep, I'd sleep for eight hours. Um, so it's finding what works for you. You're an individual. Um, so you know it might be better, although it seems you know bizarre, you know, to say, well, if you're doing an ultra endurance thing, then sleep for eight hours. And you say, well, oh, no, but, you know, I'm an athlete. I shouldn't be standing still for eight hours. That's the wrong thing to do. But if by doing that, you are much, much uh, more effective, um, then, then that might be the right thing for you. But to have somebody impose a rhythm on you, I say might not work. I mean, and, and that's, that's the, the, the thing that we, you know, we... we have to worry about and, and this is what we found you know we're looking at when we're looking at the military they have a schedule that is decided by somebody else not by them they don't have agency and agency is probably the biggest thing that allows people to get a good night's sleep is actually being able to control what's right for you um so that's the way learn what you learn what you do and if you feel sleepy sleep in, in the studies that have, um, there's not many, but um, that have looked at sleep banking and performance, do you think it could be confounded in that they've, they've not actually banked sleep, they've just sort of repaid sleep Some of the debt, debt, so to speak? So so they, yeah. they were going into the study sleep deprived, and when they're supposedly banking it, they're actually just make it, like sleeping better because they were sleep deprived before. Yeah, this is this is the, uh, this sort of, comp- uh, this is Cherry Mars' work, um, where she looked at uh, basketball players and tennis players and swimmers. What she did, this is collegiate uh, uh, university. Um, this was sleep extension, wasn't it? I yeah, think. yeah. This is giving them 10 hours rather than what, you know, giving them a 10 hour sleep period. Well, I say that's just allowing the young people to get the sleep they need. So they were restricting sleep. They weren't extending sleep. They were getting the sleep they actually needed. And so, this is the same thing with sleep banking. If you give people the opportunity to get more sleep, they probably will get more sleep and feel better because of it because they were restricted. It's not sleep banking, it's sleeping properly. And this is the whole point of what I'm trying to say. If you sleep properly, you don't have to do anything else. You'll feel really, really good, be much more effective, much more healthy, quicker faster vo2 max improves etc etc and so this is the thing get the sleep you need each and every night and then you don't have to worry about it yeah and the other thing is the um the the problem with uh many sleep studies uh as it relates to performance is um when you do other interventions you can sort of have a placebo or a sham treatment but you can't really do that very well with with sleep in that you know and there's a sort of an expectation effect there perhaps where people know that they probably should perform better with 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 that sleep extension so even if they're given the 10 hours but they sleep what they usually do the fact that they've had that 
sort of bigger window could lead into an expectation of oh i'm going to perform better perhaps um but that's that's one of the confounders yeah. in, in in research and, and that's the problem and, and 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 this is it research if you do it on a if you do it um you know properly that you control everything individuals aren't controllable individuals are different and we need to remember that and we need to do it properly we need to find a way of 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 getting our sleep sorted out to work for us to achieve what we need to achieve if that makes sense yeah for sure um so we, we, we've come up to the hour mark um is it okay if i just get another question in if that's yeah of doing? course uh, so this one's from from Bernie. Uh, Bernie's an ex colleague of mine. He works um, with uh, various corporate clients and um, members of the public. And she's asked, "What are your thoughts on measuring heart rate variability during sleep?" I mean, my my favorite quote about heart rate variability is uh, essentially that it's mathematical chaos. Um, what does it mean? Um, it, it, it's the heart is the engine it's not the driver sleep is about the brain not about the heart it doesn't matter what the heart does and that's it, if, it, it, for, it doesn't matter in sleep what the heart for, for the audience um heart rate variability is is um a measurement exactly of that so it's the variability between your heartbeats so not um we have small sort of changes in the uh, the time between each heartbeat and it's built into a lot of um fitness uh, watches and smart watches now to detect heart rate variability and um it's often used uh to as a surrogate for um your sleep stages so that's kind of where this this question comes from. So I just thought I'd explain that just yeah. just so people are on the same page. So I mean, heart rate variability, as I say, it, 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 it's supposedly you know a, a measure of the ability of the heart to you know respond. But as I say, it's just like an engine. So you know, let's be completely non technical about it. You have a heart rate variability of one. I have a heart rate variability of one. What does that mean? Does it mean we're the same? You're a young athletic person. I'm a 57-year-old fat git. Does that mean I'm as young as you or does it mean you're as old as I am? It changes during the night. Our blood pressure changes during the night. Um, Our breathing changes during the night. That is not a measure of anything other than the body goes through different stages of sleep. It's got nothing to do with the mind. The mind is the thing that is important. And so just because, let's say, it's the engine, it's not the driver. So you can, your heart rate variability can go here, there, and everywhere. But if you don't have a quiet mind, it's not gonna, it's not gonna matter. So it, again, it comes down to you're gonna panic about how terrible everything is and how you're not getting sleep because your heart rate variability is all over the place. And it frankly does not matter a jot to anybody what you what it does during the night. And as you mentioned, the heart rate variability is one of the sort of noisiest physiological measurements um, that we can measure fairly easily. But just because we can measure it easily, it doesn't mean to say that it's a good measurement and um, so it it is used as a as a marker of recovery but from my experience you have to have a very long per- lead-in period of collecting data in variety of circumstances before you can even detect any meaningful uh change so if 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 you just put your watch on um during and then compare one week to the next it's just, it, it, it's just noise it's really not going to give you any meaningful signal and that, that's the key thing, you know, to say it changes in REM sleep or it changes in this. But what it, what's normal? What's the normal parameter? And you can't do anything about it anyway, <laughs> whether you want to or not. You can't change what happens during the night because what happens during the night is what happens during the night. You, you, you can't physiologically change that parameter by doing anything. You can't. You can't change the stages of your sleep because that's going to happen according to what the brain needs to do. You can't influence 
the proportion or the timing of the stages of sleep. If you sleep, your body will get the sleep it needs when it needs it. So in the context of using HRV for sleep, you would say no point. Or... It doesn't give you any info. It only gives you stress and anxiety. Yeah. It doesn't give you any useful information that will help you be a better athlete or a better person. And also, the, the, this is part of one of the... Um, the studies that we worked on together is looking at sleep technology and a lot of the um, algorithms that are built into uh, self monitors like wristwatches and, and some rings as well is they're not uh, disclosed so we don't fully understand all of the inputs that are going into those to give us these because heart rate variability and it's uh, your, your watch doesn't tell you that it usually gives you sort of a a metric of your um some call it like a charge so if you're uh if you've had a good night's sleep and you're well rested it will give you a sort of a, a better score and heart rate variability is is a factor within that but it's we don't fully understand or we don't know how the companies are, are calculating that well th that that's it uh, and you know this this idea of a score um from from sleep it, it just it just is what are you going to do about it? How can you make that score better? And if it gets worse, you're only going to worry about it that it got worse. Um, right. And therefore, that's going to cause anxiety. And again, if you don't have control over it, and we know sleep, you, these trackers um, that you wear that, that work on, on wrist movement that have been around for 40 years, adding heart rate variability to the activity data makes the system no more accurate. So it's not adding anything to a very poor signal, which is the wrist. It's not adding any accuracy. So it shows that it has no relation to the stages or sleep uh, in any meaningful way. It may do 20 years time, you can come back to me and we'll have a different discussion maybe, but at the moment it is meaningless anxiety um which we can safely ignore in my view it is interesting because we've got access to more technology and methods of measuring physiological signals uh, than ever before but someone like yourself who's been researching sleep for uh, 40 odd years and reminds me of um a uh, a recent sort of a, a, on a conference and it was with um someone that's a, a fatigue scientist and he's come to the conclusion that the best way to, or in his view, to find out if someone is fatigued is to ask them <laughs> how they Absolutely. feel. Absolutely. Same with tired. Are you sorry? Same with sleepy. Are you sleepy? Yes. Right. Go to sleep. And we should do that to ourselves. If we're sitting at home and our head starts nodding in front of the TV, go to bed. Your body's telling you you need sleep. Go to bed when you need sleep. Sleep as long as you need and wake up naturally. It's no more difficult than that. Yeah, and that's the way I see a lot of these tools like um, fitness apps and trackers and things is they're just that. They're a tool that give you some additional information, but ultimately the the decision should be with, with you. You shouldn't be, in, um, be dictated by your device. That might help you over time get an understanding, for example, if you're going to bed at different times um, and waking up at different times, then that could be why maybe you, you're not sleeping so well. Uh, so understanding patterns, but not necessarily using it as a, as a tool to go, oh, I didn't get enough deep sleep. And that's one of the other questions that um, is actually on here is about REM sleep. Um, let me just scroll up to it. So um, Andrea asked if the REM phase is so important, are there any methods to increase the duration of REM sleep? And we've already established that measuring REM sleep from your watch is probably going to be inaccurate anyway, but it, is there any way of doing that, Neil? So increasing no, well, REM sleep? Well, first of all, REM sleep is not the important part. It's deep sleep, uh, the N3 sleep. REM sleep is a completely different state of being. So, um, so first of all, that's uh, an issue. Um, and then the, the next thing is the only thing you can do about it is to sleep. Sleep is sleep is self balancing. It's about homeostasis. You get the sleep you need when you need it, 
for the duration you need and sleep will, will do what it needs. Uh, and so there's nothing you can do except for sleep for the amount of time you need. So if you're an eight hour night person, you need to be in bed for at least eight and a half hours. If you're a nine and a half hour person like me, you need to be in bed for at least uh, 10 hours in order to get the sleep you need. It's as simple as that. There's nothing you can take, there's nothing you can eat or drink that will change the percentage of the stages of sleep. The only thing that will change that is whether you give yourself the ability to get the sleep you need. How, how do you find out how much you need? Because like you mentioned earlier, a lot of our schedules are dictated by work and fa uh, family commitments, etc. So you might be, say, getting routinely seven hours, but how do you know that you like need eight, for example? Because, because as I say, you 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 won't you'll feel awake during the day. If you don't feel awake during the day, you're not getting enough sleep, or there is a problem with your sleep. It is as simple as that. So it's about getting. Uh, giving yourself the opportunity to get the sleep that you need. And that's the key thing, that opportunity, because um, if you don't give yourself the opportunity, then you, you know, if, if you're an eight hour night person and you're only in bed for seven hours, you will never get the sleep you need. It, it, it's no more complex than that. Uh, so first of all, you need to see sleep as important and then you need to do it. And, if you know it's a cross that I bear that I have to be in bed for 10 hours a night or feel rubbish it and I think that brings us back to Cam's question earlier on which was he read about the eight hours recommendation but he seems to wake up after six or seven hours yeah. but no, no matter what so he, trying to then force an extra hour is probably going to be counterproductive it's and going to be and it, Utterly counterproductive. And the key thing is, 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 is exactly that. He's then thinking, I must try to get more sleep because I'm not getting this mythical eight hours. Rather than thinking, right, I've had the sleep I need. Great. I've got, you know, uh, two hours to learn Spanish or take the dog for the walk or knit blankets. I, you know, hurrah, hurrah. Isn't it great? I've got all this new time in my life. Whereas that fat git Neil is still asleep, <laughs> um, you know, fine. That that's that's the way it works. We're all different, as I say. Um, it's like height. There's nothing you can do about it. I think that's a really nice point because it might put a lot of people's minds at rest, particularly as we become sort of more exposed to to articles and uh, things in the media about um, you know certain amount of sleep, like the commonly cited eight hours is that if you if you don't get eight hours and you feel okay and you've got none of those sort of red flags that we've talked about it, such as having to reach for caffeine nodding off in the day if you're functioning well throughout the day and you you're um not feeling sleepy um then you're probably getting enough sleep right it's simple as that and and, and don't worry about it don't don't measure it don't worry about it just ask yourself how you feel if you if you you know running or shooting accurately, then fine. And sleep will benefit your athletic performance absolutely if you allow yourself. And you need a lot of sleep, so give yourself the time. You know, over the summer or in the winter, over Christmas, just find out when is your sweet spot for sleep. But um, don't measure it. Just wake up and go, yeah, I feel great today. Well, what did I do? Well, I slept for nine hours. Right. Well, obviously, I need nine hours sleep. Do it the next day. I'm just going to just something that was um, asked uh, on one of these questions. I won't scroll to it, but it, it was it was on related like for parents, particularly um, new parents, is that they're going to have their sleep disrupted um, and what recommendations or tips could you give for um, well, people under those circumstances? Okay, the problem with, with newborns is uh, until they're you know, probably one, one and a half years old at least, they have no conception of day or night. They certainly have no conception that mummy and daddy have to go to work the next day. Uh, a newborn needs 16 to 20 hours sleep. A 10-year-old needs approximately 10 hours sleep. Um, so... 
as your granny would say, uh, allow a child to sleep whenever, wherever, uh, never wake a sleeping child. Um, uh, and as I say, never stop a child from going to sleep. What's interesting is that you mentioned about uh, your experience uh, where you had a bad night and then you had a good night the next night. Well, one of the bizarre things that we do is that we, of course, share the responsibility each night. So you get up for the first uh, cry and then your partner gets up for the second truck cry. Why not just one of you get the duty for one night, have a completely rubbish night uh, whilst the other one has a good snooze uh, elsewhere uh, and then you swap the next night so you only each have what you know a bad night every other night um we, we have these bizarre sleep patterns but as i say let, just let a sleep child sleep and if the child goes to sleep you sleep if you can get a nap whilst they're sleeping because they're sure as hell going to wake you up when they want you to be <laughs> awake true. Yeah, no problem for that <laughs> So go to sleep when they go to sleep, but give the <clears throat> child the opportunity to sleep. It's the most important thing a child can ever do. It's the only time you physically grow is during your deep sleep. Um, you need you lay down memories. It's the most important thing a child can do. So let the child sleep and then grab the sleep when you can. Share the duties in a sensible way. So every other night you're on duty, the every other night you're somewhere else and you're not called upon and you can get as good a night's sleep as possible. Brilliant. Um, there have been a couple more questions come in, but I think uh, we'll probably leave it there because we've gone uh, 15 minutes uh, over and uh, I can see some uh, quite a few people have uh, had to, to log off. Um, but Neil, thanks very much for your time and, and, and going through you and providing some some really sort of actionable and clear points, because I think, it, as we mentioned at the start, it can get pretty confusing when there's so much information out there um on, on sleep and um the consequences of sleep and how much sleep we need etc but those real sort of simple take-home points that i personally find really useful and i'm sure the the rest of the uh, the audience did as well i'm very happy and if you want to do it again and cover some more questions feel free to ask paul it's been a pleasure brilliant and there's there's been quite a few more that i've not got around to so we'll maybe look to do that in the future yeah uh, absolutely okay. it's been a brilliant. pleasure paul Okay, Cheers. thanks very much then, Neil. Uh, thanks everyone for joining us and uh, we'll see you soon. Thank you. Bye.